thanks, Dr. Greenwood. Thank you, everyone, for having me. I'm really excited to be here today and visit the campus and tell you a little bit about uh, my dissertation project. Um, so what I'm going to review today is uh, similar to the, manu for the first manuscript that we put out for the project. So it's not the, all of the details of the project. Um, but essentially what we did was we tested a commercially available uh, genetic screening kit on weight loss outcomes in a weight loss study. So here's a little bit of a preview of what we're going to go over today. And I'll start with the background. So perhaps some of you have heard of these kits that are out there where you can, they can assess your genetics and then tell you, you know, what kind of diet you should be on for weight loss or what kind of diet you should be on to build muscle or even what type of exercise you should be on. Has anyone ever heard of these types of DNA kits? Show of hands or yay or nay. So here's just a few examples build muscle, select your plan. And one thing I really want to point out here is how expensive they are. Um, you know, 500 bucks a pop or so um, for one person. And that really, really adds up, yeah. Um, so they're making money. Um, another thing that I think is really interesting, especially with this one is, I mean, how, especially to this audience, like, do we need D a DNA kit to know that this type of training and a tailored diet will work? for building muscle. Um, there's also other companies that have other products, ones to help you improve your cardiorespiratory fitness, nutrition for weight loss, and this, I think, is my favorite, the superhero kit. So what kind of superhero could you be based on your genetics? Um, so just to dive a little bit deeper into these kits um, and their different price ranges is usually the more genes that they look at that are associated with different things like metabolism or muscle strength. Um, the more genes that they look at, the more expensive the kits are. So here's the first one about fitness. Here's an example of how they market what they're looking at based on your genes for nutrition. And then for superhero, this is the cheapest kit. Maybe I consider doing it because it's cheap. Um, only six genes to look at strength, intelligence, and speed. So what about today, I'm really going to focus on obesity and weight management with genetics. So what do we know about genetics and obesity? Well, first, we know that there are actually two different types of um, genetic conditions linked with obesity. There's monogenic obesity, and that's one gene which causes the phenotype. An example of this is Prader-Willi syndrome. There's also polygenic obesity, so this is considered common obesity. And this is really what the kits that we were talking about focus in on, is a, a combination of different genes. These uh, genes that they look at, they're called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. And so this is one variation in one pattern of the gene, the whole gene that they're looking at. And so when we talk about polygenic, that's a combination of these things. And all of this data came from these giant studies. They're called genome-wide association studies. And these studies really found um, different candidate genes linked or related to obesity. And in the context of the other kits we were looking at, candidate genes have been identified related to muscle strength and fitness. Um, but again, we're going to focus more on obesity today. So with this identification of these possible genes, this is what um, really came about this whole idea for genetic profiling for weight management. So what do we know about genetic profiling, or really what is that? So essentially, you pick candidate genes related to your health outcome. You observe the influence of these genes at baseline, or the baseline genotype. You look at health outcomes and their response to the intervention or treatment. You see how their changes, what changes um, occur. Um, and this is often used to predict clinical outcomes um, and determine treatment in oncology. So this is also um, a similar pattern used with precision medicine. The difference with an oncology setting and what we're talking about today with genetic profiling for weight management is that in the oncology setting, there is a lot more research to support uh, precision medicine, animal lines, animal models, cell line studies, um, before it even reaches to the human. And we'll talk about more with weight management, um, how we're, that, does, hasn't, we're, that type of research and that rigor hasn't happened yet. So genetic profiling is a new concept in weight management. 
And so the question really is, which genes should be included in the profile for weight management to optimize our weight loss success and improve our health outcomes? So what do we know from the research? Because of course, when we have these questions, first we have to go back and what do we know? What's out there? So we know that the research is inconsistent regarding the genes selected. We also need more prospective studies, so a lot of the study was done retrospectively. But there was this one study by Doppler Nelson and colleagues. This was a retrospective trial. Simple intervention, and what I mean by that is they used a commercialized diet program, so that's widely available to the public. They tested the Atkins, Ornish, Learn, and Zone diets. Um, they also used a practical genetic profile. What I mean by that it was a, is that it was a commercialized genetic screening kit. So similar to what I showed you in the beginning of the presentation. And they actually found retrospectively when they looked at the genes or the genotype from this kit that's available commercially with patients on these diets where the diets match the prescribed diets from the kit, they found clinically significant results favoring the profile. So it worked. They found a two to three fold reduction in weight, a reduction, a significant reduction in waist circumference, significant reduction in triglycerides, a significant increase in the good type of cholesterol. So this is huge. So we thought, okay, let's look at the candidate genes used. So let's flesh this out even more before we get really excited and spend a lot of money on a trial. So let's look at each um, gene that, or SNP that's featured in this genetic profile. What do we know? We know that each gene is strongly associated with obesity. And what, do we, what are the suggestions out there? The suggestions are that more research needs to be done looking at these genes alone and in combination with a low calorie diet or hypocaloric diet. Also, because the genes are linked with fat metabolism primarily, we know that there should be variations in fat and some with carbohydrates if we're gonna test these genes together or alone. And then we also know that more research is needed also including exercise if we're gonna profile with these genes. So, then we thought, well, what has been done in the exercise and sport nutrition lab? So, the ESNL has tested a commercially available hypocaloric moderate protein diet, and, that, and they found that this diet plus a supervised circuit style resistance exercise program has led to greater outcomes compared to other commercialized programs such as Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig. So this program works really well, this commercially available program, on all of these outcomes. So, this is really what led to the aims of this trial, is let's go ahead and test this commercially available profile that's only been done retrospectively, that worked in this retrospective study. Let's, test, let's couple that with the commercially available diet program that has been used in this lab that has shown to work and provide better outcomes compared to other commercially available programs. And let's see if prospectively this kit can work. We can produce great um, weight loss outcomes. So our primary outcome was to look at weight loss. And we did this in a 24 week weight loss program. And this study was specifically done in women. The reason why we only conducted this trial in women was also because the Doppler Nelson and colleagues trial was also done in women. So we wanted to stay consistent with previous research. Additionally, the commercialized diet and exercise program tested in the lab is uh, traditionally conducted in women. So that's why this trial was exclusive to women. The secondary aim was to see if the profile and diet matching worked to change other health markers. So anthros, body comp, cardiopulmonary fitness, muscular strength and endurance. So what did we do? So this was a 24 week weight loss intervention. Our participants had random assignment to genotype based on their diet. So half of the women were um, selected to a diet that was prescribed based on their genotype. They were, those were the true matches and the other half of the women were assigned a diet that was the opposite of what their genotype from the commercialized kit would prescribe. So those were the false matches. And so here's a, a look into our eligibility criteria. We were looking for women, overweight and obese, apparently healthy, um, who were sedentary. 
So this is the study design and everything that we measured at every time point in my dissertation project. So every month after recruitment and signing of consent. Today, we're just gonna focus on outcomes for body weight, body comp, waist and hip measurement, fasting blood, samples, um, the cardiopulmonary exercise task, and muscular strength and endurance. So, okay. So what did we do? So we had these recruitment sessions. We pre-screened our women for eligibility. Um, if they were eligible based on our screening, we did the informed consent and we gave them a lab tour or a lab tour and then a uh, review of informed consent. Um, they signed the consent and completed their medical history form. Um, we conducted a physical exam. So height, weight, BMI, resting heart rate, and blood pressure, this was so we could provide this data to our research nurse who had to clear everyone before they started in the trial for safety purposes. Um, we also did a buccal cheek swab, and this was to collect the DNA sample. So after we got that cheek swab, we shipped those samples off to the genetic company um, who created the kit to bring us the genotyping data back. So let's talk a little bit more about the genotyping. So we sent it to this company who created the kit. So they are a certified molecular genetics lab so that does give them credibility um, for their research methods and their methods for genotyping. Um, this is an example of the, out, the data that we would receive back from the company. So this is each SNP or a gene that was looked at and then based on the allelic pattern here or the variation in the gene for each person, each person is a barcode, that's their diet prescription. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the diet prescription in a moment, but what I will essentially say is if they were a better balancer, that means they could go on either a low carb or a moderate carb diet. Those were the two diets that we were testing in this trial. I'll talk about that momentarily. So if they were a better balancer, we offered them participation in a second weight loss trial that was being conducted in our lab uh, concurrently. But if they were the carb reducer, then they were um, either true match to the low carb diet or false match to the diet that was higher in carb but lower in fat. And then the same thing for fat trimmers, they were either a true match to our diet that was lower in fat and higher in carb, or a false match to the lower carb, higher fat diet. So, our dietary intervention, we started with a one week primer, 1400 calories, then the rest of the diet for, from weeks two to 24 was a 1500 calorie diet. Our moderate carb diet, so we called this our moderate carb diet, this was really um, our higher carb, lower fat diet, or the true match to the fat trimmer. And then the low carb diet was the lower carb diet and then the higher fat diet. So that's the true match to the people with the carb producer, prescri carb reducer re prescription. So just to show this again. And then false matches would be the opposite. So the, both diets were moderate in protein and that's because again, previous research from our lab has shown that this moderate protein diet um, was most effective at improving weight loss and health outcomes coupled with this uh, resistance exercise program I'll tell you about momentarily. Um, for this diet, this was part of the Curves Exercise Program's diet. So all participants followed this meal plan online. They had it on their phone, similar to like a MyFitnessPal. And then for the other diet group, participants received menus and I taught them how to use the diabetic exchange system for serving sizes for food. So they had menus and they had a little bit different way of following their diet because it wasn't all online like the Curves program. And then everyone received a multivitamin and mineral supplement. So what about the exercise? So we use the Curves exercise program. This is a moderate intensity resistance based uh, circuit interspersed with calisthenics or Zumba, 30 minutes a day, four days per week. In our lab, this is the old lab, not the beautiful new building that y'all have now. Um, but this is what it looked like. And so here's us doing Zumba in between the machines. Um, if, they, if it wasn't a Zumba day, they did Zumba one day a week and then calisthenics uh, three days a week with the resistance exercise. They were following Jillian Michaels on TV and doing whatever Jillian told them to do. 
Um, also, to just increase lifestyle activity, we gave them pedometers and said, try to get 10,000 steps a day, at least three days a week on your non-circuit days, just to keep them moving. So what did we measure every month? Anthropometrics, body weight, body comp. We used our DEXA for body comp. We also did uh, uh, administered an international physical activity questionnaire. This was to look at lifestyle activity data. And then food logs, our favorite four-day food logs, which we entered into the ASHA program. Um, at baseline, 12 weeks and 24 weeks, we did a cardiopulmonary exercise test. Um, we did fast, we collected blood every month, but we analyzed the data for blood lipids um, and insulin assays, uh, or excuse me, for blood lipids at baseline 12 weeks and 24 weeks. And then we also did muscular strength and endurance um, baseline 12 weeks, 24 weeks. And then glucose and insulin, um, again, baseline and 24 weeks is what we have the data on. So how do we analyze this data? Well, a priori um, calculations, our goal led to a goal sample size of 80 people. Um, so we did two analyses, um, a preliminary analysis, a complete analysis. So basically we used univariate, multivariate, um, repeated measures, general linear model. Um, we used for dietary data for everything else. We did the same thing, but we used baseline variables as covariates. Um, we did some po post hoc comparisons. We calculated effect sizes for our intention to treat analysis. So we also conducted that, um, and that was for this complete analysis means that's for everyone who completed the 24-week trial. The intention to treat analysis is when you look at data from people who started the trial but dropped at some point. So we used um, expectation maximization as our statistical method to replace the missing values, um, to compute the values out to what the predicted value of that person would be for 24 weeks. Um, and then we looked at the data um, with intention to treat with a larger sample size. And this will make a little bit more sense when I show you the results. Okay, everything was done in SPSS. So what did we find? So we assessed 255 people, and this was about um, 15 months of data collection. So in 15 months, about 255 people were assessed for eligibility. Um, we signed on 191. We actually genotyped 97. Um, because there was a little bit of lag time between signing the informed consent and getting the genotype results back. So there was a little bit of a wait. We consent them, we send the results out, wait a couple weeks to get the results. At that point, um, some uh, participants maybe wanted to drop because, oh, you know, they signed up and then decided, you know what, this is too much time, not for me. Um, others may have received the neutral genotype, the better balancer, so then they went to the other trial. So of the 97 people who were either carb reducers or fat trimmers, um, we randomized 51 to true, 46 to false match, and we completed at six months 29 fa true matches, 22 false matches. So first I'm going to uh, review the complete analysis. So this is everyone who completed the trial baseline to 24 weeks. So for baseline characteristics between groups, um, and we, I sliced this in three different ways. True matches to the moderate carb or low carb diet, false matches to moderate or low carb. There were no significant differences in baseline variables. Um, the same thing was seen for true and false matches or moderate carb and low carb diet. No differences there. Um, dietary compliance, so everybody, significant time effects for calories, so everybody reduced their total calorie intake. And there was a genotype by diet effect or trend um, which just showed that the, which group was it? False low carb had the least amount of calories at each time point. They consumed the least amount at each time point. point. Um, for carb intake, a another time effect, so a significant reduction in total carbs consumed um, for everybody. And then a genotype trend, so not significance. And it looks like the low carb diet as expected Eight, more car eight less carbs at each time point measured. So we want to see that. Um, for protein intake, everybody increased their, uh, significantly their um, protein intake, um, which is what we want to see um, because they were on a moderate protein diet, 45% of their calories from protein. Um, 
they didn't quite get that goal, but they, I would still, even though they were about 34% of their calories um, from protein by six months, that's still um, enough to be considered a moderate protein diet. And then for fat intake, everyone significantly reduced their fat intake. So what about compliance to the exercise intervention? So everybody increased, so this is uh, their lifestyle activity. Um, and so these met minutes calculations are from the International Physical Activity Questionnaire. So everyone reported a significant increase in vigorous intensity met minutes. Um, everyone reported a significant increase in leisure time met minutes. Um, and as for their circuit workouts, so the four days per week that they came into the lab, um, the workout completion rate was pretty good, average of about 80% um, workouts completed, percent workouts completed, uh, excuse me, 86%, and then the average heart rate and peak heart rate with no differences between groups. No differences between groups if we look at genotype by diet, by genotype, or by diet. So that's good. Everyone was compliant. Um, so now let's look at some results. Let's look at the body composition. So everybody lost weight, fat mass, and body fat percentage. Uh, there was a trend in time for fat-free mass. So everyone you know, lost a little bit of fat-free mass, um, about a half a kilo. Um, trend in genotype effects for body weight, but by six weeks, or excuse me, 24 weeks, false matches lost more body weight. A, a trend in genotype for fat-free mass, again, by 24 weeks, people falsely matched to their diet, actually did a better job of preserving their fat-free mass. And here's what that data looks like for body weight at each time point. So this black line is false matches. And again, false matches, lost more fat mass, fat-free mass, meh, they're kind of the same, and then by the end, False matches did a little bit better. Um, body fat percentage, again, false matches by the end, lost more body fat. So what about visceral adipose tissue? So this is that fat that's around your organs, which has been shown to be linked with more increased risk of different um, health conditions, more so than other fat depots, such as subcutaneous fat, perirenal fat. Um, so we saw significant time effects for everybody. So everybody lost uh, visceral fat. Um, but no differences between groups at all. Um, for waist and hip circumference, everybody had a reduction in waist and hip circumference, significant reductions. Um, there was a trend in time for waist to hip ratio and a trend in genotype effect for hip circumference where by 24 weeks, true matches lost a little bit more centimeters in their um, hips. So what about fitness? We all know that fitness is linked with improved um, health outcomes, so significant time effects. Everyone had an increase in their VO2 and an increase in time to exhaustion. There was a three-way interaction trend with a large effect um, for false matches in the moderate carb group to have an increase in, um, by 24 weeks, this is an increase um, in their absolute VO2 peak. So for their muscular strength and endurance, we had significant time effects for lower body strength with an increase and also with upper body strength. And this is what that data looks like for lower body strength. Everyone had time uh, significant increase. It looks like true matches did a little bit better, although not statistically significant, but this does indicate the time effect, um, not between groups, and true matches did a little bit better for upper body strength. For our fasting blood lipids, there was a significant time effect. So everyone had improvements in their blood lipids in the di favorable direction. So reductions in triglycerides, increase in HDL, and so on. Um, there was a significant time by genotype interaction for triglycerides where false matches had a significant reduction in triglycerides. That's a pretty big deal. And this is what that data looks like by 24 weeks. Also, significant time by di genotype by diet interactions for the bad cholesterol, where true matches actually fared the best by 24 weeks. And true matches also fared the best for total cholesterol at 24 weeks. But this is, again, not statistically significant for cholester total cholesterol, but a trend with a strong effect. So what about markers related to insulin resistance? 
trend in time for insulin, significant genotype effects for insulin where true matches had a slight increase but not clinically significant. For glucose insulin ratio, false matches by 24 weeks had a greater improvement and a trend in genotype effect for um, the HOMA IR calculation favoring false matches. Here's what that insulin data looks like. Not clinically significant increase here. Glucose to insulin ratio, again, depicting uh, favorable changes for the false matches, even though not clinically significant. Um, so that's essentially uh, the data that we found from the 24-week complete analysis, which basically, in summary, showed us, as I hope you were able to see, that the false matches did way better in most of the parameters that we tested versus the true matches, which would indicate that maybe this profile doesn't work. But keep in mind that the sample size was only 51, and as I told you earlier, our a priori power calculation estimated that we would see a significant effect between groups with at least 80 people. So then we did an intention to treat analysis to say, okay, maybe we were just underpowered and that's why we didn't see the statistically significant differences between groups. Um, whether it was to favor true matches or false matches. So let's do an intention to treat analysis. Let's see what we find. And we actually, so we did this on body composition variables only, because this is a little more exploratory for fun. Um, and what we actually found was, okay, so none of these results are statistically significant. But, okay, false matches still did better with a reduction in body weight. But now when we break down the components of body composition, true matches actually lost more fat mass. And they did a way better job than false matches with preserving their fat-free mass, which we know lean mass, fat-free mass, is a good, in, if you can preserve your lean mass, that has good um, indicators of health outcomes. So that's advantageous when we're trying to improve health. Um, and then also true matches had a greater reduction in body fat percentage. So maybe, maybe the, the genetic profile does work since our intention to treat analysis did so, so show some trends favoring the true matches. So what do we take from this data? What are some things for us to consider? So strength to the study. So this was a prospect prospective matching to diet. So this is the first study to really prospectively test this commercially available profile um, and match participants to diet based on the uh, diet prescription provided by the profile. The length of the trial, this is a 24 week trial. Um, the use of a commercially available genetic screening kit and diet and exercise program. And that's important because when we're thinking larger scale, how can we generalize results and what can we do to help improve health outcomes through weight loss? What are some strategies we can do to reach a big group of people? Um, really exploring how effective these commercially available, widely available programs are is, is, is a strength. But some limitations could be our sample size. Okay, as, as discussed in the complete analysis, we were underpowered. Um, and also um, consideration of possible inter-individual variations in epigenetic factors um, that can impact gene expression um, of the candidate genes. And we do have this data. We have yet to explore um, this data, but we have the banked buccal cheek swabs and the buffy coats, monthly buffy coats and buccal cheek swabs at baseline 12 weeks and 24 weeks. So we can definitely look at this and see if that helps answer the question of why we didn't see this. So future research, larger sample size. So even with our intention to treat analysis, greater than our um, a priori power calculation, 97 versus 80, we, we saw trends towards significance, but not statistical significance. So a larger sample size will be helpful. Also, the degree of carbon fat restriction in the diets could be helpful. So if you remember when I showed you the diet, I showed you a lot of time effects, but there weren't any significant differences between carb intake between diet groups. And that just shows us that perhaps the restriction of carb and fats weren't different enough between the groups for us to see a big difference, especially because the diets um, prescribed are based on geno genes that are related to fat and carb metabolism. 
I also have another slide for that. Let me, so let me just zoom to this slide quickly. Doppler Nelson and colleagues in their trial, um, if you were, so they tested these different commercialized diets. And if in our study, if you were a true match to the moderate carb diet, you had a 25% uh, fat restriction. Whereas if you were a true match to the low fat diet, in the Doppler Nelson and colleagues trial, you were in the Ornish diet, and that's less than 10% calories from fat. So perhaps this is what I mean by the degree of, of carbon fat restriction, is maybe we didn't restrict enough between groups. Um, same thing if you were the low carb diet, you had about 75 grams of carbs per day, but in the Doppler Nelson and colleagues where they did see the significant difference, you were assigned to the Atkins diet where you're getting less than or equal to 50 grams of carbs per day. So let me go back to where I was. Okay, so also the incorporation of a structured exercise program. So this was the first trial to test this profile with a structured exercise program, which is suggested from our literature review. Um, so more studies should consider this. Also to mention Doppler Nelson and colleagues, the retrospective trial that found that the genotype, or suggests that the genotype worked based on their um, findings, they did not have a structured exercise program. They simply told participants to do whatever they wanted and encouraged exercise. So what can we conclude? Basically what we can conclude from these findings is that prospective testing of the skit for, of the kit, excuse me, for weight management is still in the exploratory stages um, and, and really more work needs to be done. So there is promise that it could work, but we're really, when you see these commercialized genetic screening kits for weight management available, I ask that you please take that with a grain of salt and remember, where's the evidence? Go back to the evidence, um, because we're still at the early stages of this. So always go back to the science and the literature before you make a decision and spend a lot of money. So with that, I would really like to thank um, Gosh, so many people, starting with my doctoral committee and Dr. Kreider, who was my mentor while I was here at A&M, um, Curves International for funding the trial, um, ESNL staff, and then all of my lab mates who, I mean, I couldn't have done this work without by myself, um, and it really, it truly does take a village, um, and I'm so grateful to have worked with so many great lab mates and have, have learned from everyone. So I thank you, and I'll take any questions. <laughs>